in homicide, we've been working together for so long. We can get out and just do things without even asking. I get out the car and I walk back over to where the body was laying, but it was a sheet covering him. And then I see a couple of my family members start pulling up. I'm like, why are they pulling up? So my two cousins come up and say, hey, man, tell me they ain't my nephew. I said, which one? Like, tell me they ain't Vante. I'm like, I haven't even looked under the sheet yet. Right. So pulling the sheet back and seeing that that was him, I mean, I lost it at that point. Right. Knowing that now my family is out there hurting um, and they're going to want to know answers. And that night, I wasn't going to go home. Like, I wouldn't have been able to come home and sleep well knowing that the person who killed my cousin is right. still out that there. That would have been my question. Is, did, they, did they make you take a break or did they let you just... No, we just no, we just just kept working. Yeah. Just kept working through the night. And the thing about homicide is as long as you have a lead, you keep working it. We go days without going to sleep. As long as that lead is hot, we stay on it. Right. And thank God that on that case the lead was leads were still hot to so we were able to, you know, keep on with that case until we till we found that guy. Are there bad cops? Absolutely. Are there superheroes? Maybe. I aim to change your perception about policing and police officers in general with my guest today. He has so much good that you will wonder if there's some superhero in there, but he also has a ton of humanity to make you appreciate how human we all are and how much more alike we are than ever before perceived, especially when it comes to the community and policing. This gent definitely raises the average. It's an honor to have sat down with him and learned from him, and I hope you enjoy the time too. Please help me welcome to the TCAST, Detective Jermaine Rogers. Okay, so the first thing I'm curious about mm -hmm. is, and, and we'll jump back and forth probably off this based on your, on your answer. A lot of people have heard about you and your brothers, and in particular, your brother that was incarcerated. So I'm, I'm curious, without being super generic, about how you guys were raised, because what interests me is how two guys from the same household can take two different paths. And, and as a second question, does did his path have anything to do with your inspiration to go into law enforcement? It did. Yeah. Uh, so just going back, so me and my brother, we grew up, he's 10 years older than I am. He's the oldest grandchild that my grandmother has. Um, and we grew up in the same house, same mom, same dad. Uh, he's 10 years older than I am. So I grew up looking, you know, up to him. Yeah. You know, he, he was my role model growing up. Um, I grew up at the age of, what, four or five playing football. That's what I saw my brother doing. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, as I got older, of course, my brother moved out. He went to college. And I'm just this little, you know, almost teenager. You know, sitting at the house, uh, watching my brother go off to college and play football. And of course, uh, he decided to come back his senior year uh, of uh, of college. And when he got back home, he was doing the wrong thing, hanging around the wrong people. But one thing for sure that my brother did was that he didn't allow me to do the things that he was doing or even being around the same people that he was around. If he saw me anywhere near the hood or anything like that, it was a problem. My brother was bigger than me, so of course I'm going to do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so he's very big. Yes, big guy. Uh, so, well, that's interesting, though, too, because just the act of saying, hey, I want to protect you from being involved with the cats that I'm involved with is almost an admission of I'm hanging around with the wrong people. Correct, correct. Right. So w what was it, do you think, that w did it have any – obviously, he left after the familial unit thing, so he went to play sports and everything else because a lot of kids escape that type of life by leveraging sports right and he was not only in those sports but he was collegiate level success yes he was so how does that happen i mean how he, he was he was my hero when i tell you that i will go to the, he went to jackson state university uh so me going to the games i'm like man this guy's like he's the bomb like he's you know he's it so then of course he leaves school and then when i see him of course he's doing the wrong thing when he got back home but he didn't allow me to do those things. He said, man, you're playing football. And I was good at doing it. You know, I was in high school uh, at the time. By the time he came home, of course, I was in high school playing ball. And um, he knew that I had an opportunity to do great things then. 
But what I didn't tell you earlier is that growing up, I was wearing police uniforms. At the oh, age really? of four and five, like, I would cry when they would try to take the uniform off of me. <laughs> <laughs> so growing up, I knew that it was going to be the football or I was going to be uh, in law enforcement. Or both. Or both. And the thing is that growing up, I didn't see police cars riding out, you know, out in front of us, in front of the house, anything like that. Uh, my favorite police officer was uh, <laughs> Carl Winslow. If you're watching uh, the Urkel, you know, mm-hmm. he got... You know, Carl Winslow, that was a police officer that I saw, and that was on TV. That's fascinating. Yeah. So your your experience as a child was different than a lot of people's experiences in, let's call it America or whatever. Correct. Um, and But it was still like a fictional character. <laughs> it was a sure. fictional character. Right. And then I look at my life now, I was like, yeah, you're living that, um, that Carl Winslow uh, family <laughs> thing now. <laughs> You're taking it up a level. I'm taking it up a level. So I have all these kids in the house now, uh, extra kids in my house now. And that's just what it is. But getting, getting back to my brother, um, he, he kept me away from those things. Um, and a lot of people don't know the story is that uh, my freshman year in college, I uh, drove back from Louisiana. That's how I was going to school at University of Louisiana. And I had a friend that was from South Florida. Uh, he decided, hey, Jermaine, I'll come down to Alabama with you. I'm like, that's fine. So we drove down, we stayed home for about a week. And my mom would tell me, Jermaine, stay away from your brother. You know, he's not doing, you know, the right thing right now. So me being hard headed and I want to hang around my brother. <laughs> like, right. like yeah, I just want to play. I want to play Madden. I would play Madden every right. day. And I knew that my brother had Madden at his house and, you know, we just play all day. So um, we ended up going up to my brother's house. We're playing Madden. And the stuff that my brother doing, he wasn't going to do it around me. Uh, so we just at his house. So then we end up leaving, going back to Louisiana uh, after spring break is over with. That next week, uh, my brother goes to jail. And that's when he served his, his federal sentence. So if my spring break was a week later, then I would have been there and my other teammate would have been there. Right. And certainly we his protection from correct, got himself. Correct. So. It? Do you mind me asking what it was, the arrest was about? I'm not. Yeah, no, 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 it's, no, it's no problem. Uh, he was arrested. He was, it was for a conspiracy. So you don't have to actually have the drugs on you. Right. You know, friend, somebody can say that, yeah, I got this amount from, from Tony and that's what it was. So he was sentenced to 27 years in federal prison. Uh, and I look at it now like, okay, what if my spring break was a week later, but I'd be still out. I'll be in that situation that my brother's in, yeah. even though I had nothing to do anything, just, being in the wrong place. How how close in age are you you and your younger brother? Uh, uh, me and my young brother, younger brother are five years apart. Okay, so a little closer. Right. So that was less of an influence. And so watching that happen to your brother, who leading all the way up to that was kind of on the straight and narrow and had some goals. Right. Um, what what made you? At what point did you decide to get into law enforcement? Was that literally a leap from college straight <laughs> in, or so with me? Um, Football is all about camaraderie. I mean, love being around the guys, uh, and I love that feeling. So, of course, I majored in criminal justice, um, graduated with that. As soon as I got done with school, I started working for Lafayette Paris Sheriff's Office. I work, worked there for a year and decided, you know, it's time to move back home. Is that uh, in jail? Right, that's in the jail. Okay. Right. So I moved back home, and once I moved back home, started working for the uh, Mobile Police Department. But the thing is that I didn't want to work for Mobile Police Department. I want to work for anyone else outside of Mobile. So when I put my application in, I put it in for for Pritchard Police Department, anything in Baldwin County, uh, but not Mobile. I didn't get a call back. So I was like, all right, maybe I need to put another app, another application and check Mobile spot this time. Yeah. And then I did a Mobile call. The reason why I didn't want to work for Mobile is because I knew a lot of people in Mobile. I didn't want to deal with the people in my community because you know, is that relationship. So yeah. I didn't want it. Almost a conflict of interest. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Man. And I didn't want to deal with that. I didn't want to be laid on like, man, they're going to call me a sellout because I'm, you know, policing my own community. Mm-hmm. But then it really worked out for me because knowing a lot of people in this city is going to help you out on different cases or even when I was in patrol, help me out there. So, so that's, that leads to a really interesting point too, because there's the discussion about bringing police officers onto a department and putting them into matching cultural areas to work. Right. And there's obviously there's great advantages and great disadvantages to doing things like that because you're essentially just segregating the police department, (laughs) but you're also allowing people to go in that understand the, a lot of the communities that they work in before they have to start versus 
you know, putting some, you know, big white goof like me into, into the hood and, and, and me learning how to adapt and understanding right. a different culture, which right. I thought was a fantastic experience personally. But right. I know that causes a lot of issues with people that can't handle it. Correct. So correct. do you have any thoughts on, <clears throat> on how well that might work? Because your situation was even more so because you right. literally grew up here. <laughs> exactly. For the ones that like, if you can't adapt to where you're going to, then it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a learning curve. It's going to be a culture shock. Um, I've had that before to where some people don't understand how we are and how we act. we're loud naturally, you yeah. know? So some people may take our loudness for aggressiveness and it's not really like that, you yeah. know? So and interestingly yes. enough, I, I was talking to somebody recently about some characteristics and stereotypes that they try to teach. You know, you go through right. the academy and they'll say, right. hey, when you're dealing with Hispanic people, you need to not do this and be careful not to look so-and-so in the eye and this and right. that. <laughs> and it's really so bizarre, really, right. because it should be so much simpler than that. It, it should, should be. really just be a human-to-human interaction. But there's so much tension right now. Right. Is there anything that you think, based on the experience that you've had? I don't. How long you've been on? First of all, I've been on for ten years. Ten years. Ten now. years. Okay. Ten years. So you're not a rookie anymore, no, well, but you still got a long way to go. Got a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. We need that. Yes. We need man. Every time somebody says, "Man, I'm thinking about being a police officer," I'm I'm amazed because nobody wants to anymore. Right. That's but true. Not for the right reasons necessarily. I think right. there's a lot of public dissension, but. Do you do you feel like there is a solution in terms of how police departments hire? I know you're in a a mid sized department versus right. a giant department versus right. an apartment with twenty people in it. I mean, there's right. there's a lot of differences in those types of departments right. too. But any any kind of solution that you've seen as you continue to work out there? Um, my thing is that I mean, if someone is just looking for a paycheck, being a police officer isn't going to be it. I mean, you look at the paychecks that we get, it's not enough to say, okay, well, I'm going to handle this job and also deal with everyone else's problems in the community because you're going to have to take on the role of mom, dad, uh, auntie, uh, being a pastor, uh, accountant. I mean, you're going to deal with so many <laughs> stuff dealing with people and their problems. And you're going to look at that paycheck and like, nah, this not what it's for. If you're doing it for the paycheck, you're not going to stay there long and you're going to hate your job. Do you still feel like there are, are opportunities to really get in and help people authentically because i know a, a, a lot of times policies and um stat driven departments mm -hmm. tend to frustrate officers about well you know i can't really spend half the shift on trying to get this guy help i just need to take him to jail and write something up yeah so do you, do you find opportunities like that or do you yeah do you, but do you, you find it difficult yeah you can't you can't arrest your way out of an issue that someone is having um, sometimes people may need, um, certain resources for you to, um, to help them out, to get through whatever they're going through. Mm -hmm. You may respond to a call to where a person is, you know, dealing with some type of mental illness, uh, but you think they're acting erratic or, or disorderly when you can easily take them to a facility that can better help them out with, uh, with their, uh, mental health. Is there something that you drew from? your brother's story that you feel like we could teach kids that could be easily in the same boat that could keep them from heading down that path other than just adults telling them, Hey, you should hang around better people. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always the, um, the people that you hang around, the company that you keep. If you want to know your future, look at the people that you hang around. Um, with my brother, um, uh, his son, uh, which lives with me now, um, that dude is, he's awesome. You know, um, man. <laughs> hmm. So me and my brother was me and my brothers like that. We're super tight. Yeah. And my brother left and went to prison when my nephew was like almost one. And the closest thing that I had from my big brother was, of course, his son. Yeah. And uh, of course, I stayed in his life uh, the entire time. And I would be so hard on him because I know exactly what his dad was into. I'm like, look, this is what you need not to do. Just talking to him and telling him. And then of course, come, becoming a police officer, you see so much, you know, so much that the average eye or the average person doesn't see outside of what they see on the news. But there's more than that that's not on the news. Of course. So when you tell them what's going on and what's really in this world, um, they start to understand and start to listen. Um, he's a my nephew is a 10th grader now um, uh, in high school, doing very well. Just got his first. Uh, well, not his first, but he got a. Um, 
scholarship offer to go to University of Alabama. Yeah. And that's great. So, I mean, maybe those talks did work now for him. Yeah. And, um, well, we need more people like you. I can tell you that because <laughs> he's a lucky kid too. Right. And your right. brother's a lucky guy too, oh, uh, exactly. for that matter. Um, yeah. Because it, it really does. It's an admirable move to right. to just take over being the dad, right? Because right. we exactly. know what that can do. Right. You know, being missing exactly. as well. And, and not only that, I mean, just for his mom, like to trust me and like, okay, look, I need you to help. Even he, he's not a bad kid at all. It's just he needs that male figure in his life. Right. No, to help him uh, go the right way. Different, different right. accountability Definitely. partner, right? Definitely. Is there anything that you took also from your athletic career and potentially something you could, you know, teach to your your kids or your nephew that you uh, implement in your police work? Mm. Uh, discipline. So I remember when I came out of the police department, and I didn't. Of course, I'm, I'm a rookie at the time, and I don't know if they saw it because of my size. At first, that's what I thought it was. It was like, hey, did you play ball? I was like, uh, yeah, I play football. And I was like, hey, I said, why did you say that? It was like, the way you carry yourself. I'm like, how do I carry myself? I'm like, just this stature or this presence that you have that mm. that's, I, didn't, I didn't pick up on to it. But uh, sports gave me discipline. Um, and it gave me that from the age of four to, uh, of course, when I left through college. And that rolled over into um, into law enforcement now. Uh, and how did sports help me in with police? Yeah. Um, I thought, like, physically it would have helped me, but had no idea that during the police department, you were going to run miles and miles <laughs> and miles <laughs> and miles Why didn't every I do day. <laughs> you should have played wide out. Man. Yes. It's like, I didn't do that in college. We ran sprints. We didn't run miles every morning. <laughs> And uh, I thought I was in shape, but the best shape I was in in my entire life was in the police academy. Yeah, they they are still calisthenic based running <laughs> fools. But hey, yes. you get in that first chase with all that gear, get all that gear, and then you're like, right. all right, that's why. I guess, right? <laughs> exactly. That's but funny. but dealing with uh, even going through the academy, how sports really helped me with that is that of course in the academy you're going to have your sergeants, you know, hey, you know, do this, you know, and I'm used to that. It's like, okay, style. yeah, that military style. Even yeah. though I was never in the military, but I was in, you know, I played sports, played football, played right. collegiate level. And you're used to hearing, you know, that in your ear and you just take it, you run with it. You take that criticism, whatever they're taking, you you take it and you learn from it. Yeah. And and that's what I took. And I'm glad that I did because if I didn't play sports and then, of course, I'd be in my feelings. Oh, he's screaming at me and I would have been down, ready to yeah. quit. It's that you know, old school that. chirping. You oh, know yeah, they definitely. mean well. Exactly. And so now that you've been on the other side, do you, do you involve yourself in any athletics on the side or anything? You coaching anybody yes, or anything? I do. So I was coaching my nephew's team, um, youth football. Mm -hmm. And I stopped coaching youth football once he got to high school because um, I want to be more involved with him, right. watching him going to play. Um, high school football. Uh, I also playing a uh, kickball league. It's Williams Coed Kickball League, and it's every hood inside of Mobile in one spot playing kickball. Hmm. And that's one way. And I have a um, police team. The police team plays in that league, and you have teams from hoods from all over the place in one spot. Like, man, how can you put all of those neighborhoods in one spot and have no incidents going? So we're able to build a relationship with our community through kickball. I tore my ACL out there playing kickball. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking I'm so young. My wife tell me, Jermaine, you're 35 years old. You're out here trying to play kickball. <laughs> you sure you want this to be on the yes. tape? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm, yeah, not, my, no, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm good. My brother's a big old hulking <laughs> fireman, too, and he got, got into one of those uh, pickleball things and did the same tour as calf or something. <laughs> so, so I get to it the, happens. I get to the doctor and they're like, um, so how, how did you do this? <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I'm outside playing kickball in the kickball league. I'm like, playing kickball? I thought you had like a cool story to give. Yeah, on how you you got to think of one. We'll come well, up yeah. with one. <laughs> so that's also a, a fascinating thing. How did you manage to organize something that, because obviously communication with the communities that we're, that we're trying to, you know, we're right. trying to, to put law enforcement and communities together to, to better understand one another. Right. And a lot of times you see departments having like forums and, a question and answer, which is great, right? But something like that seems invaluable, especially when a lot of the perception is, especially with youth sports and stuff. Right. Up. You got all these parents running out and getting in fist fights <laughs> in their fifth graders' baseball games and stuff, right? So that seems like a really unique opportunity. How did that come about? Where you brought the community? In? Um. So, so Dwight Williams, who's uh, over that uh, kickball league, him and his father, 
uh, they they called me. It's like, hey, can you get a team together with your police officers? I said, like, yeah, I can I can try to get some. So I put out a city email. It's like, hey, anybody want to play kickball? Let me know. So we went ahead and uh, ordered some kickball shirts. You didn't like call the ringers first or anything? No, I you just have. put a, all, I the, all points <laughs> bulletin. Okay. <laughs> So I put an email out. Some people were, you know, they were interested in playing. So we got, I'm competitive. No matter what I'm doing, if I'm out right. investigating a case or playing sports, I'm really competitive. So I get there. I mean, I get everybody up. We go and practice a little bit. And I'm looking like, all right, we may be okay, you know, at best. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we get out there. We finished a full season. And of course, when we first started, we're getting side eyed because, you know, we're a police officer. But a lot of people recognize me from the show, in which that, that helps a lot too. But they're like, you know, we out here playing with the police. But as the season went on, it got better. You know, we was able to out, be out there uh, speaking without talking with our community mm-hmm. and not in a way to where we have a uniform on and we're talking to them. Now you're meeting us without the uniform and we're building that rapport. We're building that uh, relationship with yeah. our community. And we've been in that league for four years now. Uh-huh. And the people in that league, the people in our community actually love us now. Yeah, so, that's so we, now it really knows you as humans because yes. you're just talking sports. Nobody's. Telling right. somebody what to do. Exactly. Or, and that's fascinating. Exactly. Fascinating. So when you back up, you get onto the PD, you go through that academy, you realize, okay, now I can run. Now you're a sprinter. <laughs> you know, that's going to be good until you're at exactly. least 35 before you pull something. <laughs> How'd you end up? What's the trajectory to homicide in this department? Because you, you fast track. It was a fast track. I didn't expect it. So... I get out of patrol. They put me in the busiest, the highest crime area mm-hmm. in the city. Uh, and, and I loved it. I ended up buying two rental houses inside of that community that they put me in first. And I love that community. So uh, I dealt with a lot, dealt with a lot of homicides, uh, dead bodies, all of those things. And who would I see all the time? The homicide unit. Mm-hmm. So uh, Jeff Booth, uh, he was, which one did we just see? He's he's oh, in the yeah. corner. He's the pitcher in the corner over there. So he's the pitcher in the corner. So he comes up to me one day after working a day at body. He's like, Jermaine, what do you think about coming to homicide? I was like, I don't know, man. I said, I'm getting my master's right now. And I know it's a lot of paperwork in homicide. I know it's a lot of paperwork that I'm doing right now, writing yeah. all these papers. Yep. I said, uh, maybe not right now, but I'm about to be done in like a month. And he was like, uh, all right, let me know. So I see him again on another one. Every time I see him, he's asking me about it. So I'm like, all right, boo, who, who, who I need to talk to? So um, I go in, I talk with um, our sergeant, um, and I sat and talked with him for about two hours. You know, it's like an interview, like he was grilling me. He's like one of those drill sergeants, you know? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so I'm talking to him, he's telling me about everything. And I was like, you know, I, I do want to come to homicide. It's like, all right, well, you know, we'll see what's going on. So when I heard that I was coming to homicide, I'm walking in the back of headquarters and I see Booth. I said, Booth, man, I talked to SARS, man. So they said, man, I think I'm coming over. He said, man, I told him, I said, man, I just bought this nice blue pea coat, man. I'm ready to wear it on the scene. <laughs> he says, hold on. I don't even know if you're coming or not. And I'm like, I said, I, can need, I need to take my coat back. <laughs> <laughs> don't make me return don't, this, don't take me. Don't let me take this. And it was a nice pea coat. He's like, now I'm just playing with you. He said, man, you're coming. <laughs> so uh, you go straight from patrol to homicide. And that's a huge learning curve. Huge. You go from working the streets, going call to call, and then you go to homicide to where you're uh, doing long interviews. It's not just taking statements like you're in, right. in patrol. So now you, um, you're you doing search warrants. Uh, you're doing interviews. Man, you're doing all those things that you've never done in patrol. And it was a huge learning curve. Yeah. My first case that, that I was assigned, uh, it was... I think I got my first case within like a week inside of homicide. So I get that call and I'm shadowing Gillespie, Sergeant Gillespie okay. now. And he's moving a person, a person, a person so fast. I'm like, oh my gosh, you want to slow down? That's what I'm saying in my head. You want to slow yeah. down? So then we get back to the car and my head is ringing because it's like, how am I going to keep up? I'm just coming from Troy. I'm trying to keep up, trying to keep up. But I'm glad for instance like that because it made it hard for me in the beginning. I was like, okay, if I can get through this, then I can get through anything. So, so a trial by fire, sort of. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and there's so much to learn. We do talk about that too. Is something that's not depicted on the show because, let's face it, it'd be boring as hell if it was on the show. But it is a <laughs> buttload of paperwork. Yes, it and, is a lot of paperwork. Yes, and, and watching the show, you would think that, oh man, it's so cool to just go and interview this person, go look for this person. Oh yeah, he did it. You know. They don't look at 
all this stuff you got to do. You got to type all this paperwork oh, up. Sure. You got to do this and do that. It's a lot. But I grew up watching the show. Did you really? I grew up watching the show. Yes. The show's been on that long? Yes. And I'm old too. You're old too. <laughs> well, when I say I, grew, I was, a, I was a teenager. I think I was maybe in, I think I was in high school. I think I was in high school when I first started watching it. Well, something admirable about it is they, they really do find good teams of people to highlight yes. and, right. uh, and, and paint everybody in a good light. Right. So it, the only thing I have to compare it to is cops. Cause I did a couple of episodes of cops Me and, too. and, um, so how would you compare? So if you did cops and you did this, there's so much, um, obviously it's real time. Cops is one camera. It's just a take. So they got to yes. sometimes I come back, let's get a shot of this car pulling up to where oh. we can get another, <laughs> Jack, get make it an interesting <laughs> shot, you know, but that's like the next day you're waiting till the same time of night and everything, you know, right. so stage a little bit, but the call isn't staged <laughs> Not at all at all. But how much of that do you see in this? So tell me a little bit about the experience yeah. of like running with a crew. I mean, you plus you're a new cat. And right. then you got somebody putting this on tape. You're like, man, exactly. maybe you shouldn't film this to like figure it out. How do you feel? So, so with me coming over, um, I was on cops before. So I had two episodes on cops and they were with me for nine weeks straight, okay. uh, filming things. They used two episodes out of those nine weeks that they were filming. They were filming. And it was something that I had to get used to, like the camera being in your face all the time, you know? Um, but it was different because all they had was a camera guy and a, and a boom mic guy. So yeah. they had one guy in the back seat, which is the um, the audio guy. And then, yeah. of course, you had the camera guy in the front seat. And every time I get out, they jump out the car. Um, so getting a homicide, I don't, a lot of people probably don't know, but when I watch the show, I can tell is that with First 48, uh, we started at the same time. I came in May of 2016. They came in June, I believe, of 2016. So when, you, when I'm watching the show, I'm like, man, it looks like I'm not comfortable with what I'm doing. But yeah. to everybody else, like, oh man, you know what you're doing. You know, you're good. <laughs> you know, yeah. but me, I know. So this show, we've been filming here in Mobile for almost seven years. And I, just, I can see the growth in me, you know, throughout uh, each, each episode. That's really cool, though. Right. And I mean, yeah, you go back and watch anything you do, though, you know? Yeah. You probably right. watch your tape when you were a high school senior being recruited versus. What you do oh, yeah. just two years later, you're probably like, oh, no, <laughs> exactly. we'll never do that anymore. <laughs> exactly. So that's good. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do is exactly. get better. Exactly. So, and is the crew and everybody seem to be the same type of people and they all get along and all that? Right. Right. Same people here. I mean, who's all still there now? Uh, me, Julius Nettles, uh, Glenn Barton, uh, Ken Gillespie. Um, Stan Ladner, he's back. He's our uh, lieutenant. Um, Charles Bagsby, he's our captain now. He was our lieutenant in, in homicide. Okay. Um, who else? Uh, Jeff Booth left, I think, within a year when I got to homicide. Uh, Nick Rapo, uh, he's still here. We call him the GOAT. There you go. Because um, he's been in homicide maybe for about 12 years or so. Okay. He spent his whole career pretty much in, in investigations. Well, yeah, and it's it's an elite spot, right? Yes, and that's it why is. I was asking him. And you fast track to like it's like saying, "Hey, I'm going to go to homicide or SWAT or something." You know, one of those right. elite spots, right? Um, how how much do you guys have to do with getting permissions when you do these shoots? Because you'll know mm -hmm. from cops. You said you did nine weeks, right? Nine two weeks. of the episodes stuck. I'm sure there were episodes where. They couldn't get somebody to sign the waiver. And you're like, I would have made a good one, but right. they didn't want to be on TV. <laughs> so you already know. Yes. So, so how did, how does that process happen with these guys? Oh, uh, we hear, I mean, it's th the family decides that if they want to or not want to, um, air their, their story or not. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much how they, if the family doesn't want to do it, of course they they won't air it or anything like that. Okay. Well, in, th in that case too, it's a interesting way to honor the deceased. It is because right. one thing for sure, when when someone passes away, people they're gonna, you know, they're gonna think about you for the first maybe week or so, and after that, you know, they've pretty much almost forgot about you. Yeah. With this show, it's like not only your family is gonna know you, but everyone probably on this planet is gonna know because everybody watches the show. Yeah. So it'll be to where this person can live on and not just you know pass away, and then certain people forget about you. Same thing as my cousin. Everywhere I go. Um, my cousin, of course, was was killed, and you know the show aired it. And everywhere I go, no matter if I'm at um, 
at a concert to where there's rappers there. And I talked to them. They asked me about my cousin. Mm. It's like, man, everyone knows him. That's really, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it is. It really is really cool. So uh, pivoting a little bit, um, how do you feel as uh, as a black officer versus some of your white comrades in the way that you're perceived? Because in the people that I've talked to and the things that I've seen, it seems like black police officers are overlooked because the, the contention is usually between a poor community and white police officers, mm. which I kind of understand in concept. I said, but I mean, that's. That doesn't explain what's going on at all. When I mean, you got people like you who are doing amazing things, how does it make you feel to be in the middle of that? And is there ways that you're able to kind of control some of that narrative since you have a little stake in the game? Are you talking about overlook for us, promotions and things no, like just, that? No, just in terms of uh, how you're perceived as, you know, like you said, you oh, were concerned. Awesome. Yeah, because you were concerned oh, okay. even going into it at, at first. You're like, well, you know, I'm kind of worried about going in back in my community and they give you the side because right. like man you went to the other side but right uh, how do you deal with that perception when there's a, when when they have a lot of this contention going on about you know how the police can't relate to the communities and everything right. else it seems like they're talking over your head when you're like hello look at all the stuff i'm doing yeah exactly so you you put yourself in a position to where you're out and you're in your community and of course you have a black police officer and a white police officer and things aren't going their way. Then the first thing they do is look at you and like, you know, you're a sellout, you know, you're doing what he's telling you to do now. Right. It's like all this work we just putting in, you know, trying to you know, build a rapport with our community, knowing what was being put out about police officers and, and you just have to move to the next person. So if I can get in touch with the next person and make him feel that, okay, you know, we're doing our job. Maybe that person can talk to the person that, that's saying, oh, no, you're a sellout or, you know, this and that. So you just so. focus on a case by case. Case where, by case, definitely. And you're right. Sometimes you can't just focus on the can't people that everyone. are going to go sour. <laughs> right. But I just, I always found that fascinating because there's someone like you who's doing so many amazing things in the community, in the department, and in your family. It's just pretty right. remarkable that someone could lump you into those conversations right. or not even mention you in those conversations because that should right. be part of a part of a big group of those conversations. It's exactly. Uh, exactly. Tell me a little bit about, so your family life is pretty extraordinary. We got here, yes. we're like meeting all these people. I'm like, man, you are, <laughs> you are like a miracle for these kids. So yes. you have two daughters, you are helping raise your nephew. Right. Three daughters? Three daughters. Three daughters here. So I have a, <laughs> so I have a uh, four-year-old, five-year-old and eight-year-old. Eight. Okay. Uh, my nephew, he's 16. And then we have to, uh, I have a foster son. He's 14. Okay. Uh, we, me and my she was my girlfriend. Then we lost our first daughter uh, back in 2011. And then uh, we ended up having my eight year old London uh, after that. But we thought that we couldn't have kids after our first one passed away. We've been trying for like, we tried for like two years and like mm -hmm. for years and couldn't get, you know, couldn't get a child. I'm like, man, what's, what's going on? So we started, you know, we was like, well, maybe we can do fostering. So we tried the fostering deal and then. Next thing you know, she gets pregnant while we're <laughs> talking about going to fostering. So I was like, all right, we'll we we'll hold off on the fostering. Then we started fostering, went to the foster class and then got our first kid. And that's in of itself, a, you know, a heroic feat to take on some kid like that. And that's that disposition, everything. Um, what would you tell people who are considering doing something like that? Do it. We need more foster parents, more great foster parents who are willing to put in the work uh, with these kids and because they need them. You know, I go on calls all the time and see kids and seeing what position they're in. I'm like, man, can I take this kid home? Yeah. But of course you can't, you know, you have to trust the system to put them in the right place. Uh, the kid that we have now, he wasn't in the right place. Didn't have the discipline or anything. Four years later, you know, this kid is miles and miles, like miles away from where, how he used to be when we got him. Right. And then speaking of heroes, uh, your wife must be, Pretty remarkable too, because your yes. your schedule is erratic. There, right? So, what <laughs> does she do? So, my wife she works for Department of uh, Human Resources, works for DHR. So, she takes those kids uh, that's um, being taken from their family because something is going wrong there. Um, and we would talk about that all the time, you know, about this kid situation, that kid situation, and we only can take kids almost just one at a time. I wish we can yeah. just flood our house, you know, with those kids to put them in better situations. Yeah. And the kid that we have now, of course, he'll be in a better situation once he leaves from here. 
we've had at least 10 kids to come through our house and wow. we still keep in touch with with those kids uh one of them uh he's he just graduated high school last year we went and um went to his graduation last year and then um he's like calm he's like dad he's like um i want to be a police officer i was like really <laughs> like awesome. I, was, I was like okay man so so what's going what, what you need what you need to do he's like all right you know i need to get this done that done okay you know i'll send him money whatever he needed to get done and then uh he's been trying to get into the to the police academy that's fantastic. Right. That says a lot about you too. Right. <laughs> so this might be a dumb question following that because do you besides actually caring for kids who really need you, including your own, <laughs> uh, do you have any causes you and your family or anything that you that you pursue or anything any kind of either charities that you support or any type of cause that you follow along with or uh, we try to do any kind of type of community engagement if it's uh, stop the violence walks or anything like that. I bring my kids with me. Or even if we're out doing a kickball thing where we set our tent up and we allow everybody else, to, I mean, just fellowship with everybody in our community. Yeah. Uh, even so, my kids, they, everyone in this community know my kids. They know my wife, know my nephew. They know everybody involved. I, mean, I, I want, and I want them to know um, just a way to reach back, not to say, hey, you're just going to meet me and not, you know, my, my family. Yeah. And to make it more uh, personable. So, so how did you actually respond to the scene when you when you found out that your cousin passed away? Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a crazy story. So I'm at I'm at headquarters. We get the call to go over to the gas station, Riverston Homicide. I get there, I see a white car at the gas pump. I'm not thinking anything. So I get there, I get out the car. So man, in homicide, we've been working together for so long. We can get out and just do things without even asking. Right. right. You get out, you see what everybody's doing. Okay, I need to be doing this. So I go, I pull a couple of people, talk to people, talk to them. I get out the car and I walk back over to where the body was laying, but it was a sheet covering him. Um, so we're just sitting around talking. And then I see a couple of my family members start pulling up. I'm like, why are they pulling up? So my two cousins come up and say, Hey man, tell me they ain't my nephew. I said, Which one? Like, tell me they ain't Vante. I'm like, I haven't even looked under the sheet yet. I haven't looked under it. So my, once I pulled it back, and this crazy thing is that I always tell, like, victims, families, this, you don't want to see your loved one like this. You know, when you see him, you want to see him, of course, at the funeral home. Right. Like, the image of his face is still burned in my memory right now. So yeah. it's like, I, I can't even, I can't unsee it. Right. So pulling the sheet back and seeing that that was him, I mean, I lost it at that point. Yeah. Knowing that now my family is out there hurting um, and they're going to want to know answers and and it's a lot of weight because i know that you know everywhere i go they're going to ask me jermaine what's going on what's going on but my team ensured that we're going to turn over everything find whatever we need to find uh to see who did this to your cousin that's what they did and that night i wasn't going to go home like, i wouldn't have been able to come home and sleep well knowing that the person who killed my cousin is right. still out that there my question is did they did they make you take a break or did they let you just no we it? just no we just just kept working yeah. just kept working through the night and the thing about homicide is long as you have a lead you keep working it like you can't have a hot lead and be like well we'll just pick up tomorrow yeah we go days without going to sleep as long as that lead is hot we stay on it right and you know thank god that on that case the lead was, leads were still hot to so we were able to you know keep on with that case until we till we found that guy yeah that's that's really tragic and it is true that was an interesting point you made too about seeing that and then not being able to unsee that i mean right. I mean, for some people it's traumatic even seeing somebody in the coffin because that right. really doesn't look like your loved one either exactly uh, exactly. But it's there's a disassociation because it it looks like someone else right. versus seeing someone in that disposition where right. you just you that's the last thing you want to see exactly exactly man well I admire if you've been able to stay on it and your team for letting you stay on it there'd be <laughs> right. a lot of people that probably had advice for you <laughs> yeah like, like man you might need uh -huh. to go home <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, I'm not gonna listen to you so <laughs> you want me to hear uh, I'm gonna be working it regardless <laughs> You're right. Yeah, culturally, is there something that needs to change in order for parents to do something different and avoid putting so many kids into the foster system, foster care system? Is there something you've learned over over the years where you fear there's some kind of consistent process where we could 
either mentor the parents early on or change their behavior so that it doesn't put so many kids out there. So those are the resources that I was talking about. So say if you respond to certain domestics or things like that, those people are really screaming out for help. Uh, it's something that's going on to where there's kids around them. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get the help that they need, then of course it's going to trickle down to, to those kids. Yeah. And once those parents get in that domestic issue, then of course, uh, Department of Human, Human Resources, they would have to step in and remove those kids. But if they can get the right parents in classes for the mom or the dad, or in some cases, just the mom at home, they need those resources to figure out how they need to do to get better at parenting. Yeah. Um, I have my brother that just got out of federal prison in October, and um, him and his son has to build a relationship that their relationship has only been in prison through visitations and phone calls. Now he have to make up this time because in two years he's gonna be going off to college. Right. And now you gotta build that, you know, um that time back where that you missed for fifteen years. Yeah, that's gotta be rough too. And you mentioned that he got out. So he got out early too because of some right, right. some power moves that you <laughs> made too, right? <laughs> he did. So it it's like it's crazy. Me and my brother talk every single day for fifteen years since he'd been in federal prison. Wow. I mean, that's just how our bond was and still is. It's it's super tight. Uh, he's only cried twice that he's been in federal prison. Once to where he called, and um, I had to tell him that my, my daughter passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to tell him that. And, uh, you know, he cried at that point. And then the next time was that uh, I told him that his, um, his sentence has been uh, reduced uh, about six years. He couldn't believe it. You know, wow. are you serious, man? Are you serious? Are you serious? Uh, a lot of people in our culture, in our culture, they always say that uh, free me or free such and such. I've never in 15 years po did a post that says free my brother and thing like that. That's not going to free him. Right. Uh, what I did was I used the ed education that uh, I had in college and wrote the judge a letter. Uh, so we put in a motion. It's the second, uh, I'm sorry, it's the first step act that Trump put into place to where it allowed federal inmates with certain drug um, drug cases uh, early release. So I called an attorney um, to try to help my brother out. Mm -hmm. The attorney told me that I had half of a percent chance for my brother to come home early. I said, half a percent? I said, so I have a chance, right? Yes. <laughs> I have a chance. So you're saying so, there's a chance. <laughs> you're saying there's a chance. So um, I wrote, wrote a letter, uh, explained everything. My brother, had been he was in federal prison for 15 years, serving a 27-year sentence. And uh, I told the judge he's never been in any kind of trouble and, and while he's been in federal prison, he, and he's never has. Mm -hmm. um, so she wrote back in her motion that um, she agreed with uh, with what I talked about, along with what, what his attorney put in. And she took six years off his sentence. Uh, so with those six years, he put in uh, for another act. And then he got that. It's for the CARES Act. He got that. And then he was able to come home in October. In two years. Right. And those two short years that he's got time to make up are mm -hmm. key. Right. Exactly. He's, now he's got a chance to actually <laughs> exactly. bond with his kid while he's still a kid. I exactly. Mean, that's, that's amazing. Right. He did amazing work, man. Exactly. And you care a lot. That's, right. that's fantastic. I really appreciate you taking time to share this with us because I think no people problem. need to know your story. Oh, definitely. And uh, the things that you're doing are, are definitely making a print. So right. I, I appreciate you sharing time with me. Thank you. And Thank I you for coming. You <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. What you take, what you going to do, what you going to do. Success around the same, but the second grade rules. A confident thing. To make you do, make you do what they want, when they want, be the fool. A diplomatic base is the one to see you through. And don't let those bigots take you off your game, but just to let them loose. Sit here in the front.